The cybersecurity community and major media have largely concurred on the prediction that cybercrime damages will cost the world six trillion annually by 2021. And every year, the cyber criminal bad guys stalk you with all new scams and tricks. That's why one of your favorite insights topics will return this week asking, how cyber secure are you? Same panel of experts, all new information you need. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff with Hawaii News Now. I wish we could report that in the 10 months since we did this show last time on cybercrime, there's been a decline in online criminal activity, but the opposite is true. That's why cybersecurity sources predict $1 trillion will be spent globally on cybersecurity from 2017 to 2021. Those same sources predict damages and loss due to cybercrime will reach $6 trillion annually by 2021. As long as we are connected to the internet, we are vulnerable, and even if we never go online, we can become a victim. Just last July, Equifax, one of the largest credit bureaus in the U.S., was hacked, exposing the personal information of 143 million people. That incident joins a growing list of data breaches happening daily, but help us here. Tonight, local experts return to answer your questions and share new valuable information. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org. Now to our guests. Gregory Dunn is the executive director of the Better Business Bureau, the Northwest and Pacific Bureau, or something like that. <laughs> They've changed the organization. The Bureau is actively involved in providing cybersecurity tips to consumers and businesses. Jody Ito is the University of Hawaii's Chief Information Security Officer. She is responsible for the security and protection of the information assets across the entire University of Hawaii system. Stanley Lau is the founder of Hawaii Tech Support, a technology company focused on managing computer and network systems for businesses. And Tuan Nguyen is the FBI's Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Honolulu Division. He oversees the FBI's cyber intrusion and digital forensics programs within the state of Hawaii, Guam, Saipan, and other U.S. territories in the Pacific. And let's start off with sort of a roundtable of the latest things we've started seeing emerging recently. Greg Dunn from the Better Business Bureau, what, what have you been seeing that jumps out at you? Well, one of the trends that we're starting to see in the state of Hawaii is that uh, the fraudsters are piggybacking on top of uh, two-factor authentication which means that many companies require you to set up a separate authentication on a mobile device in order for you to access your financial accounts. Just so, I, just so that works, is, so you'll sign in and then they'll say, is that really you? And then you have to say something Get a text back. message right. and send something back. What's happening is the fraudsters are so sophisticated, they're now hijacking your phone number and porting it to a different phone because they were able to secure your username and password on your bank account or on your credit card account and setting up a, a fake phone with your number, porting it to a different carrier, and then hijacking your phone number and all of your bank accounts. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> Very scary. Uh, Duan Nguyen from the FBI, what have, what have you seen that concerns you most recently? So uh, the one thing that the FBI in general, actually nationally, not just in Hawaii, is concerned about is the business email compromise. That's the latest scam that's going around the country right now. Uh, just to give you some numbers to, to kind of wrap your head around. So in 2016, we received about 300,000 complaints for uh, cyber crime and fraud. But the majority of those calls were really related to BEC, business email compromise, equaling about $1.4 billion of losses. So that's a significant number for Hawaii uh, alone. Uh, if we want to drill down, in 19, I'm sorry, 2017, we received about 750 calls, and the losses almost half a million dollars, strictly on this just one scam. Compromise. What does that mean? Is that the uh, fraudsters are able to get on your email system, and mimic a, a message, and encourage you to transfer, a, uh, conduct a wire transfer that you, you know, otherwise would not have done. So it would not have done to be a right. client or something like that? It has to. It's in a business environment usually, and usually in a business where there's a lot of wire transfers going on. Yeah. For so, example, we had yeah. that situation in our office where 
our controller received an email that looked like it came from me that said, please transfer $50,000 to this account. I, I want you to do it this morning. Do it, do it right now, please. It's important. And the controller is like, why would you want me to do that? She walks across the room and says, hey, I got this email. Why did you send this? I didn't send it. But, you know, if she hadn't been thinking, she could have pulled the trigger to send money Mm -hmm. to the fraudster. And that's what we're talking about. Stanley Lau, you work mostly with small businesses. Mm -hmm. What kind of things are you seeing at that? I mean, uh, I know that uh, Agent Wynn mentioned it, but is that, right. is that what you guys see a lot of, or is there other things? That we're also seeing a lot around email um, initiated uh, activity, but I think one thing that's really encouraging, especially in the small business or the business environment, is some of the tools um, that agencies like the, the federal government or the Defense Department have had for years that there's finally traction, there's options, there are options that fit in our marketplace that start to detect, prevent, which which is a great thing for businesses. You know, uh, Jody Ito from UH, uh, you're, you're the only, well, I, I thought you were the only one here that's been a victim, but, <laughs> 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 but tell us a little bit about what happened at UH and, and for students and stuff, are, are there things that happen particularly to college students or professors or researchers? So in general, the university environment is highly decentralized, so we don't have the tight borders that say a business or a corporation would have. We have a very mobile um, community, students bring their own personal devices, and same thing with faculty. Faculty. So it's very difficult to really lock down a border, let's say as a bank would or a hospital would. And that the university is also highly decentralized in terms of the operations of its network. So what that means is, so while I may be the chief information security officer for the entire University of Hawaii, a department or even a faculty member could stand up their own server whenever they want to, put it on the network, and may not necessarily protect it at the level that, say, I would. Well, that's so unusual because in business, they would never let you do Absolutely, that. right. So um, we have a lot of researchers that actually will uh, investigate or research projects that say things like maybe maybe controversial other places like pornography, drug use. Of, oh, it's research, of course. It's, it's yeah. research, yeah. of course. Well, and the, I mean, it is legitimate research, so in all <laughs> intents and purposes. Um, mm -hmm. But then the, those instances make it very difficult for a university to impose corporate types of securities around our assets. So what we do, and you mentioned, uh, Tuan mentioned the fact that we're getting more uh, business email compromise, and we call them phishing email, but what we're seeing more now is targeted phishing attacks, so we call those spear phishing attacks. Is that what happened that caused the breach at NUH? At this point in time, unclear. Mm -hmm. So we know that there were uh, targeted emails that were sent, not just to that unit, but across the university, and the attackers need to be lucky once. We as defenders need to be um, have strong defenses all the time. You have, what, 40,000 people? So uh, the University of Hawaii community at large is roughly about 40, 45,000 in total. But related to the way that we handle email addresses, we actually include our ohana. So let's say you graduated from the university, but you, are, you actually have access to your transcripts through your UH username that you can keep. Oh. So that just expands what we call our threat surface. I said when I graduated, there was no such thing as email. So. <laughs> <laughs> you have to come back again then. So it's a simpler time. Yeah. So uh, you, you started, uh, Stan, without talking about some of the progress that you've, mm -hmm. you've seen and what kind of traction have, have we gotten? I mean, um, Jody, I, I was thinking for a second is that young people, right, they're raised in this computer environment. Are they any better at security than, than the rest of us? Actually, no. I think because they grow up in this environment, they just assume it's safe. Uh, it's like the telephone, they pick it up, it works. Mm -hmm. So they expect everything in their digital environment to have the same sort of ubiquitous access and security protections that actually is not there now. And the other thing that's of concern to me is where is our personal information going? We give it up so willingly to sign up for an app that gives us coupons or discounts from mm. retailers. What information are we providing? And do we know how that uh, retailer might be reselling it, saving it, correlating it? Does anybody really read those disclaimers? Exactly. Greg Dunn, what, are you seeing, I mean, you guys are trying to educate the public all the time. Do you feel like the public is getting a little bit more careful? Um, Last year, we published a white paper called The Vulnerability Illusion. And uh, most people believe that senior citizens are the most at risk for um, cyber attacks or, or fraud via cyber 
uh, activities. And in reality, it's younger people. Um, and they're losing smaller amounts of money. They're losing it more frequently because they tend not to understand how to set up the, the security protocols that one would need. We're having a conversation. When you, this, uh, when hmm? you say younger, what, what, what are you talking about? We're talking about college? 14 to 30. Okay. Anyone from 14 to 30 normally. That's because the more vulnerable that's class. The, that's, uh, statistically, they, lose, they have lost the most money, and they're the ones to most frequently lose either direct dollars or to lose their identity. Um, one of the worst things that can happen to you is you lose your, your identity to an identity thief who's opened up credit accounts in your name. Um, it can take you about six months to reestablish and reclaim your identity, and you'll spend on average of 700 hours of your personal time trying to clear up all of the different accounts because the burden of proof is on you as the consumer to prove you did not open that account. So does that class of people or that group of people, are they learning from their mistakes? I mean, are you seeing people being more careful? I'm just sort of... Once you're burned at that level, you're very careful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the things that, that we encourage people to do are set levels of authentication uh, on your computers and on your phones. Don't set up one account that's an administrator account. So if someone hacks the password, they can have access to the entire structure on the computer. Uh, set up an administrator account and then a user account. Uh, do the same on your phone. Mm -hmm. when, uh, do you folks, have you guys been doing a lot of prosecutions in this area? I mean, are, pe are we catching people? Are we getting we are. this? You know, it's a very challenging area for us to investigate, but we are making a lot of progress across the country. However, you know, most of our uh, criminals don't actually reside in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so the partnership with our foreign partners overseas is very, very critical for us too. And so, so it takes longer for the investigation. And it's more sophisticated, but we are making progress uh, in this arena, and we're hopeful that we will continue to go down that path. How about in the university? I mean, how are you getting that population? Uh, so more it, it's very difficult. So we do um, every semester. We send a, a technology update to remind them about the security controls that they should be putting on their computers. Make sure they patch. <laughs> make sure they put password, different passwords, on all the different accounts, and use strong passwords. Uh, and but the list goes on and on and on, and eventually you, they just glaze over, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's an ongoing effort that we need to make, but we also need to build in the security protocols into our systems and services to help them also to protect them on behalf of themselves. So it, it's a multi-pronged approach. So uh, with our recent situation, we're actually going to be going out and doing a huge information campaign because we're increasing security posture, adding more security controls, and letting people know that we're um, revising our policies. And so we need to educate our community on all of that. Right. And even from the business perspective, last year we implemented across our client base um, free cybersecurity training to employees. And so the goal is to increase their, their awareness of uh, different right. attacks, whether it's um, through a lot of, we've been talking about uh, phishing quite a bit, and statistics show it's about 66% of malware gets distributed through email. So it's a significant entry point, and just being able to decipher whether an email is legitimate, whether it's um, something that they should respond to, provide information to, click on an attachment. I think that, you know, that alone is half the battle in a lot of cases. And then when in doubt, throw it out. When, exactly. <laughs> or, like, or make sure you just, ask somebody about uh, it, don't yeah. click on it yeah. first. And, mm -hmm. and it's getting difficult to detect what is a phishing or spear phishing email because the attackers are getting very good very quickly. Mm -hmm. And often we're playing catch up with them. So it, it is, you got to raise your spidey senses. You know, we, we kind of get that sense when we're kind of in, in situations that may be physically uncomfortable for us, but we need to develop those senses online too. You know, one question just, uh, I want to just touch on this briefly, is that the, the smartphones and the telephone numbers, it seems like in the recent weeks, I mean, like I've discovered that I get these calls from a number that's disguised as a number I would I Absolutely. would answer. It's Absolutely. got my area code. It's yes. got the prefix. It's at yes. my work. Yes. Um, so easy. And so Very easy. I've actually gotten a call back from my own number. Yes. Isn't that right? Amazing? And you, you go, oh, oh how did I just do that? That's, that's <laughs> weird. Yeah, let me answer and see. Yeah. And right. so uh, if you answer that, are, are you putting yourself at risk? I mean, how do you know not to answer? I mean, that, that's incredibly clever. So personally, I actually um, will not answer a phone call unless the phone number is, you know, known to me. 
So, and you, they can leave me a message and I'll call them back if it is legitimate. So. Um, we have to do that a lot more now because people, I, I get these calls I do the at same fingers, thing. right? Absolutely. I, I normally will not answer on the first ring if mm -hmm. it's not a number that I, I recognize or know right. or is already in my contacts. Right. We've already got some questions from viewers, and I'll touch on these really briefly before we move on to some more specific subjects. And we're also going to come back and go through sort of a tutorial for folks at home, um, step by step. Um, how many non business individuals actually suffer a material loss each year? in Hawaii, um, do, anybody got a number or is there one? Um, it, I mentioned earlier, for as far as the business email compromise alone, last year, uh, the people living in Hawaii lost about half a million dollars. And that's in real cash that they have sent out to another bank account that they did not, you know, was not aware where they were sending the money to and just never saw it. Again. And that's only reported. That's only reported. That's, those are the people that, that weren't too ashamed to report it. Now you guys get calls from people who are just and so, uh, you know, They've already this sent person's them. asking about citizens, non-business citizens. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what, what do you get a sense of? Any idea? Have you, what, millions, anecdotally? Millions of dollars. Over and over. In Hawaii. In Hawaii. And what happened, because you're, you're talking about not just cyber uh, loss, where it's, it's, it's fraud in that case, but you get phone calls where you have sweepstakes. It's like, congratulations, you won the sweepstakes, but we need $2,500. Uh, to pay the taxes on it. And then once you pay the 2500 then it's like, now we need 7000 before we can give you the car that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so once they, they get you on the hook, they'll continue to milk you until you stop. And, and people have lost their homes because they've continued to go along with, with this ruse. Okay, so um, and this question that someone specifically has for, for Jody about does UH have systems in place to discipline or hold accountable students or staff who breach the University of Systems? It, you're making probably with people that open up a hole as opposed to actually go into the system, right? So uh, the majority of breaches generally is caused by human error. Um, do The university does have policies in place and whatever the policy is, it's in accordance with, um, again, we have unions and mm. you know we have our appropriate HR procedures. So there are investigations that do go on and then the appropriate actions are, are done. But those, because it's personnel matters, those will be confidential. Right? Generally speaking though, I mean, is it something that you could get fired for or disciplined for if you're a a student or a teacher and you make that mistake that leads to a big problem? So again, these are personnel matters. <laughs> I'm not asking about anybody in particular. Um. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do for a living. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, true. she's going to ask me to throw her lifeline here shortly. Um, okay, all right. so, but I was going to give you an example. So this past weekend I was at a beach house on the North Shore and we wanted to watch. Nice for you. Well, it was nice. So I was get away. Get, but, but the smart TV on the wall had the ability to log into the Netflix account and, and watch streaming Netflix because they didn't have good cable. So we logged in. And last night I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot to log out. So I went onto my Netflix account and I looked and someone who had followed in the room after we had left had been accessing the Netflix account and been watching all of these movies on days after we had left. Plus they knew what you'd watched, which is kind of a Exactly, problem. it's yeah. very frightening. Right. So, uh, what again, about Stanley Lau in a business community? Are people sort of cracking down? I mean, is it something that in a lot of businesses, look, this is serious, you take your trainings, mm -hmm. if you don't take your trainings, you're gonna get in trouble, and if you screw up, we've trained you. Right. I mean, do the business- actually, actually, that's a that's a really good question, and a lot of it has to do with employee policy and training, because that's all spelled out. For example, even at our company, we have confidentially confidentiality requirements, um, acceptable use requirements. And so it's spelled out if they deliberately go against what's written in there, there are, in a sense, punishments or so corrections for that. For that, I mean, you mentioned the word deliberately go against, right. but again, in those cases of human error, right? Mm -hmm. so, what are you gonna do? So let me do? move on now. Uh, this is an example of, we'd like to show you a NewsHour story on ransomware where cyber criminals hold, con hold our content in our computers hostage for ransom, actual money. And here's a close-up look at what happened to one woman. Ina Simone is retired. She's a mother and grandmother from Russia who now lives outside of Boston. In the fall of 2014, her home computer started acting strangely. My computer was working terribly. It, it was not working. I mean, it was so slow. A few days later, while searching through her computer, Ina saw dozens of these messages. They were all the same. 
They read, your files are encrypted. To get the key to decrypt them, you have to pay $500. Her exact deadline, December 2nd at 12.48 p.m., was just a few days away. All of her files were locked, tax returns, financial papers, letters, even the precious photos of her granddaughter Zoe. Ina couldn't open any of them. It says if you won't pay, your fine will double. If you won't pay by then, you, all your files will be deleted and you will loot them forever and never will get back. Ina Simone, like thousands of others, had been victimized by what's known as a ransomware attack. Hackers, who law enforcement say come mainly from Eastern Europe or Russia, manage to implant malicious software onto your computer, usually when you mistakenly open an infected email attachment or visit a compromised website. That software then allows the hackers to lock up your files or your entire computer until you pay them a ransom to give it back. Justin Kapos is a computer security expert at New York University. It will actually lock you out of the files, the data on your computer. So you'll be able to use the, the computer, but those files um, have been encrypted by the attacker with a key that only they possess. It's frustrating because you know the data is there. You know the files are there. You know, you know your photos and everything is there and could be accessible to you, but you have no way of being able to get at it because of this encryption that the attackers are using. Computer technicians were no help. She didn't want to call the police. Her husband at first said, don't pay the ransom, but she wanted those files back. In their ransom note, the hackers wanted to be paid in Bitcoin, the largely untraceable digital currency, and have it put into their anonymous account. Ina had never heard of Bitcoin, but the hackers, in one of their many touches of what you might call customer service, provided all sorts of helpful facts and links and how-to guides about Bitcoin. Alina Simone is Ina's daughter. If you see the ransom note, you can see, oh, um, they, they try to reassure you about Bitcoin. Like, we've got screenshots or, you know, here's a link to some kind of a guide that talks you through the whole process. And here's a list of uh, providers with little kind of Yelp-like reviews next to each one that kind of explains their strengths and weaknesses. It's incredibly sophisticated. After days of debate, Ina decided to pay. She sent the money order to a Bitcoin seller, but it was Thanksgiving and a huge snowstorm hit Boston, which meant the money only arrived the afternoon before her deadline. In that delay, Bitcoin's exchange rate had changed, and now her money order didn't cover the full $500 ransom. It was about $13 short. Her last chance was using a Bitcoin ATM machine. There are hundreds of them in the U.S., and one was in Brooklyn, New York, not far from her daughter Alina's apartment. It's a very kind of spooky-looking ATM. It has no buttons. It just has a slot that uh, you, put, you feed your money into. Tuesday afternoon, the full ransom was sent to the hacker's account, but it was two hours late. Ina inserted one short message to the criminals with her payment. I wrote, I wish you all will drop dead. The FBI doesn't have complete data on how many of these ransomware attacks occur every year, but they're clearly on the rise. The antivirus software firm Symantec reports that hundreds of thousands of these attacks are launched every month. There's also a real difference of opinion on whether victims should pay. Security researchers say paying ransom only encourages criminals, but the FBI says some of this ransomware is so tough to crack that paying a few hundred dollars is sometimes the only way to get your files back. Our information was held hostage. And it's not just individuals and hospitals who get hit. Hackers have hit several local police stations. We've heard of law firms and newsrooms being targeted. Even the city of Detroit last year had its data held for an $800,000 ransom by hackers. The city didn't pay. There are people making viruses, selling viruses. There are distributors whose specialty is distributing viruses. These perpetrators, they don't have to know a line of code. They can just buy a virus and then hire a distributor and send it out. Her mom's story, however, wasn't over. Ina had paid the hackers her $500, but rather than releasing her files as promised, they sent her this message. It said, you did not pay in time for decryption. Remember, she'd paid two hours late. Now the hackers doubled the ransom to $1,000, gave her another deadline, and said if she missed this one, they would delete everything. If you won't pay by then, your you, all your files are, are gone forever. Using a message board the hackers provided, another one of those customer-friendly touches, Ina pleaded with the people she'd previously told to drop dead. We had a snowstorm. It was a holiday. I'm only two hours late. 
Did this feel strange that you're trying to communicate to a group of criminals who knows where they are in the world saying, you don't understand the post office, the snow, Thanksgiving, a long weekend. I mean, you must have felt. But what else? This is the only option. It's either this or nothing. You didn't know if it would work. I, absolutely not. But later that day, the hackers released her files in full. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham. So that piece provoked a whole discussion about what's the best way to avoid getting caught in this in the first place. Who wants, everybody had the same answer. So, so. Right, backups. <laughs> backups. Make okay. sure you back up your data regularly, routinely. Um, as Greg was mentioning, you might want to keep a separate backup copy. Uh, so uh, then you don't have to pay the ransom, you just restore all your files from the backup. Uh, Stan, uh, how, how hard is that for someone to do? To, to, run to, a, to, to keep a complete backup of all their files consistently. Right, so it's not hard. We talked about different backup options, whether it's cloud-based or even local backups to external hard drives. Um, all, most operating systems, in fact, all operating systems have some kind of basic backup that you can just attach an external hard drive to run the backup program and tell it to backup all your files to this drive. And so it's not hard. It's something that um, everyone should do. You can schedule it, and it's automated. And make sure it's encrypted. Make sure it's encrypted. Definitely want to make sure it's encrypted. And that brought up this other point about cloud storage. Everyone, you know, they're pitching cloud storage. Is it always safe to use cloud storage as your backup? Because that's what they're pitching. Mm -hmm. It really depends on who the provider is, right? So you have to trust your provider. And you may need to read some of that fine print that we all try to avoid, but that's where it will tell you if your backups are encrypted for you or do you need to encrypt it before you send it up there. Mm -hmm. And also the responsibility of who protects that data while it's in the cloud, who else has access to it. Remember, because it's somewhere else out there. Um, make sure that the provider is a trusted provider. So the, the main message coming out of about ransomware is to prevent yourself from being in a position where all your data can be held hostage is to back up your data mm -hmm. either locally on another drive or two drives like you Multiple do it, drives, yeah. or in the cloud in a safe place. Mm -hmm. um, Tuan Nguyen from the FBI, what about if you get caught? I mean, th that story actually said, sometimes the FBI says it's cheaper to pay but that's not what you guys recommend. No, in fact, the FBI does not advocate paying the ransoms uh, in any of these incidents because as you can see from the story, uh, it does not guarantee that you're actually gonna get your data back or that the bad guy is not gonna escalate that into mm -hmm. another demand. Mm -hmm. So no, we do, we do not advocate paying the ransoms for these cases. Right. Well, here we go. Caller has been locked out of own computer files and being held hostage by a hacker. She's elderly on a fixed income and can't take her computer to a repair shop. Advice? Ouch. Um, I have her call the Better Business Bureau tomorrow. She can talk to a live person on the phone and they can walk her through the different resources that may be available to her. She probably uh, doesn't have to take it to a shop, right? She may need to. It, de it depends on the, the type. Mm -hmm. You can speak more to what kind of ransomware it is, um, how complex it is, sophisticated. She doesn't mention um, having to pay something. Are there some people that just do it maliciously or, or lock yeah. up your computer? There, there would be or there should be some kind of uh, payment involved or payment request. Involved. If it's a hostage situation. Right. Payment demand. If it's ransomware. But she, there's also she viruses. She may have had a so Trojan right. horse or a virus that, that literally tore apart all of the files and have, have closed down her computer that's it's not salvageable. Sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, let's move on now to some of these other tutorial things. You folks have provided some Q&As, some multiple choice, uh, or yes and no, true and false. Let's go with the first one. How cyber secure are you is our heading on these. Private browsing is a feature on internet browsers that lets users access web pages without browsing history and other information being stored by the browser. So this is about privacy on the internet. Can internet service providers see the online activities of their subscribers even when using private browsing? Now, this is all of you folks who look at this and decide yes or no, and without giving away the answer, what are the issue? Private browsing, is that something that's the best way to go? And are you generally pretty protected if you use private browsing? Like, they won't know what 
nasty websites you might check out? So any information that is actually transmitted, and we're talking at the technical level, the bits and bytes as that data has been transmitted, if it's not encrypted, somebody can see it somewhere, which means your internet service provider could look at it if it's not encrypted. That's mm -hmm. at the technical so level. So when I'm, when I'm looking at websites, mm -hmm. I'm sending information to the websites? Absolutely. You're sending a postcard yes. through the mail. Think of it as a postcard. Anyone that, that, as it goes through, they could read both sides, see what so you're even with, So with private browsing, the answer is yes. Um, internet service providers can see the online activities of the subscribers, and the websites you go to are still collecting your information. Possibly correct. It depends on the website, how it's been set up, and most websites. How ethical they are. How ethical they are, exactly. <laughs> and Does private browsing protect you from the FBI? If you guys wanted to go find out what someone was looking at? Well, the FBI goes through a legal process to obtain the evidence that we need. It just depends on the, the provider, what they are able to provide the FBI. And so, so that question is, is difficult. It's just dependent on who is providing that data to the FBI through the legal process. Uh, we don't reach out and grab the data. We go to the provider and, and subpoena the oh, provider. So they hand us the data. <laughs> and so we don't have any control over you know, how it's actually being extracted. Right. Okay. So that in private browsing is really on the web browser side. And it's maybe the name might the web tricky. browser side, you mean? So on your computer, when right. you're surfing the internet, if you want to call it that, um, Google, Chrome, uh, Microsoft, they all have their own version of in-private browsing. And what that's intended to do is keep that browsing session clean of cookies, uh, browsing history. Um, so all of that, when you shut it down, it goes away. But I think the question is really addressing when you're going through websites, is that visible? And the answer is yes, it's still visible unless that connection is secure, and that's what Jody was talking okay, about. So, yeah. Okay, so, okay, next question. Um, this is about tracking your um, location. Turning off the GPS function of your smartphone prevents any tracking of your phone's location. True or false? Um, Greg? False? Yeah, false. It's on. So when, when, the, when they ask you, can we locate your phone, is there any reason why you'd want to do that? When you lose your phone, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so personally, I've actually lost my phone, and I have an app on it that says <coughs> find my phone, and mm -hmm. I could find exactly in the field where I dropped it. So yes, mm -hmm. there are times it's very useful. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I think it's a misnomer when you say yeah. do not trap because there are ways that apps could still do that unbeknownst to you. We were talking about this earlier. There's one particular very, very popular uh, application that um, when you, you download it and you utilize it as a messenger service that part of the terms of service are that the microphone is, a, you're agreeing to allow the microphone to be on 100% of the time. So anything you're saying in conversations, when you're walking around, as long as the app is operating in the background, it can be recording and transmitting everything you say and those around you are saying back to the cloud and they do data analytics on what you're talking about, where you are, what you're looking at, what do you want to buy. You know, let me, that brings us right to our next question. Um, smart appliances, surveillance camera systems and other Internet of Things, IoT devices are safe from malware uh, that's also a true or false question, but before we get there, you know, when we're talking about these smartphones, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, my wife was talking about getting one of those things where you talk mm -hmm. and you can tell it to do things, and I did a quick search and it kind of said, well, some of them will listen to you all the time. All the time, right, yeah. And you don't know necessarily. <laughs> Again, you have to uh, trust the manufacturer, the vendor of the product. Personally, I don't want that in my house because you don't know. And what if somebody hacks in and now turns it into a listening device? They'll know when you're there, when you're not there. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there is definitely a privacy concern. One of the things that, that we've noticed is that technology has far outpaced people's comprehension of its complexity. So you, in order to safely establish a smart home system, you need to understand how to set up a very strong firewall at the point where internet comes into your home and then the connection between the internet and your Wi-Fi and the connection between the Wi-Fi and the, um, the voice device and then the connection between the voice device and each of the individual devices. Because at any one of those points, if the security is not set up properly, that device can be activated for someone to listen in on you or use the information against you. I heard a great right. story that where they, 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 there was a couple that didn't, that didn't have any cats. They hate, hated cats. 
but they wanted to test whether someone was listening to, listening to their Alexa device or whatever it was. And so they started talking about cats and talking about, oh, did you get the cat food? And oh, did you clean the cat? Or where's the cat? And within a little while, cat ads started showing yeah. up exactly. on your browser. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's what they, they're doing is they're collecting information about you, putting together a profile so that they can solicit and mm -hmm. send you more targeted ads. I mean, Amazon does this all the time already. Right. Um, but it's now going into your home space, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let, let me ask you, you wanted to say something about the business. Yes, yeah, so I was, I was actually um, listening to what um, Greg was saying, and he was talking about devices. Even with proper security set up on these devices, part of the problem is, and this is where patching and updating mm -hmm. comes into play, is you could have everything properly set up, but once an exploit or a vulnerability, something wrong with the operating system or even the hardware um, is discovered, and until it's corrected via patches, removed from service and whatnot, there's always that risk, even though you set up your firewalls, mm -hmm. train your users, and like Jody was saying, it just takes one incident um, you know, to kind of break down all the effort that you've you know, through. Twan went from the FBI, I mean, this doesn't sound legal to me. I mean, well, it just seems like, I mean, you guys would have to go get a warrant to do this. From the thing. government perspective, yes. Uh, we do need to get uh, legal services, you know, legal processes actually to, uh, in order for us to obtain any kind of data. However, the, in the business environment, in the industry, you know, they are not held to the same standards that the government is held to. And so what Stanley's talking about is very true, is that, you know, businesses can do a lot more than what government is allowed to do. And often it's a condition of service. Exactly. It's in that very tiny well, fine print when you actually download you the even, app and you install won't even it. see it. It'll exactly. say, I agree to the terms of service and it's highlighted where it says terms of service. Right. You have to mm -hmm. click on this link and it takes you to this 50 page document that it's buried in. And then there are other links to the contract or the other terms you have to click through to find all of the ways that the company may intend to use your personal information. You know, I did get a quick question from a viewer. I'll see if I can find it in this uh, substantial pile. Uh, but uh, it, 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 the question was, Caller wants to know how designer architectures of online systems can't get ahead of hackers. We're talking a little bit about, you know, them yeah. collecting your information, sure. but yep. um, are there um, programs that you can buy or whatever that will and I know there's security programs, and, and this, I'm directing this to Stanley. Mm -hmm. that, is there something that you can get? Is there a product out there that can protect a person or a business from the whole panoply of things like that might be phishing, watch out for that, or don't click on this terms of service. It, it's going to, you know, all these variety. Are there one or two products you could get to help with this? Right. So there, even in security, there's a, a plethora of products um, that protect you from different things, whether it's OS. Uh, issues, um, antivirus, that's where a lot of that stems from. But unfortunately, software is code that a lot of times, and most times, it's written by people. And so when there are flaws in the code or the logic, that's where a lot of these patches come into place. Uh, when they put out software, that issue isn't necessarily known at that time. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, when someone discovers that, whether it's memory issues that can overflow it, you know, uh, passwords can be recovered from files um, without the original manufacturer knowing. That's where a lot of the the issues come up um, in terms of vulnerability. When someone finds that flaw, then it's exploitable. So you have to keep going, right? So let me um, go through some more of these questions because I've got several and the time is going fairly quickly here. Uh, which of the following is a good cybersecurity practice? A posting vacation pictures on your social media account while still on vacation. I know that one. Uh, B, updating your operating system and applications regularly, using the same password C, using the same password for different online accounts. Um, I think this is kind of a no-brainer, but it goes to what you were just saying. It's important to have a system that's constantly um, checking for these threats. Do, do the basic operating systems, the most popular ones, the you know Windows and so on, and mm -hmm. do they have that capability? When so they actually do have automatic updates, but you as the consumer need to make sure you turn it on mm -hmm. mm. and that you make sure that it successfully installs. Um, unfortunately, these 
patches sometimes also break applications mm -hmm. too. So what used to work before the patch may not work after the patch. So and that normally happens to me right before a trip. <laughs> it's like on the way to the airport, it says update now, and you're like, oh no. I yeah. did that. It broke my phone did, yeah. two hours before my trip. Well, yes. then they update it and they slow it down. So you right. have to buy it. Um, uh, This one again, uh, spear fishing. We talked a little bit about this. People know about fishing, mm -hmm. but spear fishing. So, a sending a virus by email. B a targeted attempt to steal sensitive information such as account credentials or social security numbers, often impersonating a trusted individual, or a denial of service attack. Now. There's actually three different kinds of threats that yes. are listed in this. Um, B is the spear phishing. B is the spear phishing. Are they getting really good at this? And how do they even know how to, uh, what to use on you? The attackers are getting very, very good. They spend time doing research on the company. They understand the organizational structure. Uh, they actually will know um, basically who you communicate with, what your role and responsibilities are. Uh, so, case in point, there was actually a spear phishing email that was mistakenly sent to my, my colleague um, who has the same name as our financial management director. And it came from somebody who's very senior in the university administration saying, hi, can you transfer money? And it was the wrong person. What was really interesting... Are you the real David Lasner? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what happened actually is the person who received it incorrectly said, you have the wrong person. Oh. And immediately they got a response saying, thank you very much. And I, then it got sent to the correct person. I get those all the time. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> right? um, and then the other things that were mentioned in that particular graphic, sending a virus by email, many of us know that. But to re a reminder to people. Don't click on the links unless you're absolutely and, and sure. Don't, don't forward it to someone don't else. Don't forward yeah. it to someone Just else. Just delete it and then clear your Don't trash. forward it to IT and say, is this OK? Yeah. <laughs> Can I also add something from the business side? Uh, if you look at what businesses do in terms of their web presence, a lot of times you'll have full rosters with mm -hmm. photos, right. email oh, addresses, on the yes. oh. positions. And it's part of their marketing. I understand that that's, uh, that's useful there. But it's so easy for people to pull a logo, names, positions, to send an email to the, the controller. You know, I've noticed recently that uh, it used to be, because I'm always trying to find people to call them, interview them, and stuff. I, I, it used to be fairly easy to call up a corporate website and then the person's picture would be there, and then you could click on their name, and it would pop up as an email. You could send them. You'd get their email. Right. But I've noticed that that's a little bit more rare now. Is that something mm -hmm. people are doing? They're Absolutely. Not Consciously. Yep. Intentionally. So they just have one email you could send to to try and alert people. Yes. Right. Is anybody looking at that email? Yes, okay. absolutely. Just, just making sure. <laughs> okay. Um, another question. Uh, which are the following characteristics of a good password? We did get a, a caller asking, are the apps that store all your passwords safe? Wow. Wow. So, <laughs> so don't give all your passwords to an app. Well, so there is what we call password yeah. safes, and that tends to be the recommended way that you store your passwords because they all have to be different. They all have to be very long and oh, complicated. Oh, they help you design and, your passwords. Well, no, they actually store, they store them it. for you. So you have one master password that will then give you access to all of the passwords contained on it. But I know a couple of those password safe companies actually had vulnerabilities uh, in right. them, too. You know so. what the safest one is? A three-ring binder. To store write them passwords. Write, write, them. write them down in a three-ring binder and put it in the safe. I have a sheet of paper next to. I have a I, sticky right. sticky note next to my computer. But okay. going back to password, real, yeah. real quickly though, is that the longer the better. Mm -hmm. nice. So co come up with a phrase instead of a you know an acronym, but a phrase that you can remember. Mary, Mary, but the contrary. longer the better, because it takes longer for them to try to break a long code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's with a good With spaces point. as well. So, so yeah, so just go back to this graphic really, but quickly. Good password does not contain any dictionary words. I don't quite know what that means. Includes upper and lowercase letters and numbers and special characters. See all of the above, and you add the tip of make it long. When we say don't contain dictionary words, what does that mean? Because the attackers can use what they call a dictionary attack. They actually have these dictionaries, and they, they try and test a dictionary word against the password to try and break it. And most people have dictionary words, and often the password will be cracked by so these So what's a non-dictionary word? Um, so ABC, QR, non, non numbers. Numbers, yeah. Just combination of right. Or even letters. capital lowercase with, or, and then, you know, if you said oh, towel I see. with the... They're really hard to remember word. ones. Yeah. That's yeah. That's, yeah, the that's the best. without the dictionary. Ones. Yeah, okay. you guys are great. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. The last of our of our uh, questions. The majority of data breaches are caused by a human error, b targeted sophisticated cyber attacks, and c weak or no cyber defenses. Now, I don't that, that 
question is not 100% obvious to me. What, what do you think? Because I picture this, we've always heard about hacking and we've seen in the movies where some guy gets into the defense and starts firing missiles. That's not what the average person should be worried about. I think uh, we talked about it earlier, you know, it's, it's all about a lot of guys who are actually doing the criminal activities on cyber, they may not even technical, they may not even understand cyber. They can buy a program on the internet that will actually walk them through the process of how to conduct a certain scam. Mm -hmm. And they'll have, you know, the, uh, the actually online support on how to do that. So yes, it, it's really... Uh, Software is a service. So exactly. it's like a multi-level marketing You were fraud. mentioning the, the ransomware things mm -hmm. that they were talking about, literally, there, the there crooks. are dozens of them that you could buy into and and, and, and they have customer support helplines yeah. to help the people who execute these ransomware attacks. Who are these people that are out there? I mean, it's it, it's very kind of frightening. It's like the, the the good versus evil cyber war going on. I mean, are they all human, offshore? Human error by far right, is it's the so number, number one, one right. cause of the it internet breaches. Uh, breaches. Yeah. So we can prevent by not making the mistakes but they're still all out there trying to beat us. And we, we can't assume that they are all overseas. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many that are here in the U.S., mm -hmm. in Hawaii, you know, in our backyard. And but some of them that are your friends and people you trust. There of course. are different types of, of frauds that happen that, that are affinity related. It's a group, it's someone you know that your kids play soccer with and they get a hold of your information and open up credit accounts in your name and, and take your money. And a lot of it is, it's financially driven. If, if, you know, if you're a programmer, you make a good salary, but if you're a, an unethical um, user of technology, and it's, it's significant. So this is a fun question from <laughs> that you guys are gonna not like. These are always my favorite questions. Um, you know, since you've come on television, you get to embarrass yourself. So has any of the panel ever suffered a loss personally? Not no. financially, no, 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 but, no. but I did have one that, that caught me. Uh, and, and encouraged me to input my, my email address in because it, it had looked so um, authentic and it mimicked uh, a survey that I had filled out for um, a company that I did do business with. And so they said, congratulations, thank you for filling out the survey. You did win a $100 gift, gift certificate. Just verify your email. And by the time I got to the second page, I realized it wasn't really the company. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the amount of spam that came into my email account was was crazy. It was, it was nuts, and um, it was it, it led to an attack and an attempt to take over one of my um, store charge accounts. And fortunately, was able to to catch it before we suffered the loss. I have a story from this past summer. So, uh, credit card bought. Uh, airline tickets. We had to. I had to make changes, so I called a call center. Um, about two months later, I hadn't rec or our company hadn't reconciled our credit card statements for about two months. When that was done, when we reconciled, we found that there were charges for that same airline that showed up on the credit card. So although we were able to catch it and dispute it, um, I just found it too kind of coincidental that that one airline that we were working with that I had to make the calls on. There were two fraudulent tickets that were purchased on that. But it also taught me one thing is that um, for us, we have a lot of recurring um, charges that are on credit cards. And so just even for a simple thing, we separated out um, for the regular recurring charges, uh, we, we requested a new card with a new number and we separated those key charges onto this new credit card so that if the regular one-off cards, um, if that ever got, Compromise, then we don't have to go through the hassle of changing with 20 or 30 vendors, um, updating all that card information. Yeah, that's that's one thing people are un yeah. unwilling to. Oh, I got to change my card. That's that means right. I've got so many things on my card. Right. Oh, and please don't ever use your debit card yes, to buy anything online. Card. Never use your debit card online. I, just, because the liability, there is no liability. I mean, they can take everything out They'll of take it. Take all or, of your cash. Right, credit cards is limited to fifty dollars. Is the limited loss. Um, debit cards, not so. And then um, you, you've, you've dealt with cases here. What, what are some of the saddest stories you've seen in terms of uh, victims over here? I think the elderly, uh, very, very vulnerable uh, segment of our society, uh, many of them that we have heard about, they lose their retirement through these scams. Mm -hmm. You know, they either click on the wrong button or listen to the wrong 
pitch uh, from a debt consolidation early retirement scheme, and they would actually send money. And so, and for those people, it's, it's very, very unfortunate, very sad. For us to yeah, they don't have the same opportunity to re-earn that money. They have what they have saved over their entire working life, and so it's devastating for the elderly population. You know, what is it about the elderly population, I think, other than, I mean, that makes them so uh, vulnerable? It, it sounds like they're not as involved with technology as a lot of people, but they're just... They don't stay current right. with what's going on out there, and right? I think in the workforce, we're trying to stay abreast mm -hmm. with the changes. I think people who are retired, they don't pay attention to these changes, and so I think they become more vulnerable because they're just not keeping up with, with the, the threat. And that, the, uh, the other thing is culturally, they're very trusting. They, mm -hmm. they believe, small kid growing up, we didn't lock our front doors, mm -hmm. we didn't lock our cars. You wish you didn't have to. Right, yeah. and, and, but so it's a different time and uh, I think it's hard for them to adjust to that. It used to be that criminals would bust out the window and come in to rob your house. I mean, now you're inviting them into your home through your computer and your telephone. Right. And, and people are not used to that. And so they get caught up in the dream and you know, the ether of this beautiful, wonderful win, and I can take care of my family finally better than what I could with what I've saved up after 50 years of working. You know, I've got a uh, question here, um, and this goes to the question of how do you know if something's happened to you? Because they don't, they may not come in and hit you with a, with a, a sledgehammer anymore. Now they're going to be playing with you, finding ways to get to you more subtly so you, you don't discover them right away. So this caller is asking, she's starting to get emails from people and companies I don't, the caller doesn't know about with appointments and activities that don't apply to me. Should I be concerned? Does that sound like anything familiar? Delete. delete. Yeah, just delete, delete it. I think those are phishing attempts. Yeah. They're trying to get somebody to respond to it, mm -hmm. to uh, acknowledge that there's a real live person that's reading these emails. And so, if and if they reply, that's the time when right. they're definitely yeah. hooked in. It's one, we had a conversation earlier about big data, and one of the things that happens is a sifting of data. So someone buys a massive database of millions of email addresses, and they'll send out these kind of emails. And if someone responds, that then gets escalated to a higher quality list, because there's someone that's live there that will respond. And then if they get money out of them, then you go on a sucker's list, which shows that you're inclined to give money. So then you, you have higher value in the black marketplace, in the dark web, to uh, as a victim because you will normally be re-victimized over and over and over again. But to, to answer that user specific question, she may not necessarily, she or he may not be in any immediate kind of uh, compromise or danger. Mm -hmm. It may just be uh, something that he or she signed up for and all of a sudden she's getting spam because it, does, it mm -hmm. just receiving email messages that they don't recognize, you know, that in itself there's nothing really wrong with. Another uh, quick question now. Caller feels she, to that point, right? They, they're, you're constantly being asked to sign up for things. Yes. Caller feels she's being forced to sign up for Messenger by Facebook. Is this legit and are there any risks in signing up? You're smiling? <laughs> I'm pointing at Greg because we had that conversation earlier. Oh, okay. I, I can neither confirm nor deny what, what the terms and conditions of the use of any application may be, but would encourage people to read all of the fine print. In Facebook? In any, any application, application that you download. Yeah. Um, a lot of times. I mean, come on, really? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing. So the people you were talking about with the cat thing and they were worried about the, the one home device that they had, it may not have been that home device. It may have been their phone. It may have been a, a messenger application or another third party application on their phone that when they sign up for the terms of service, the microphone on their, their phone is on. And as part of the terms of service, you agreed to allow them to have access to the microphone 100% of the time. Right, to add on to that, when, when was the last time you actually analyzed what the prompt's saying when you download an application mm -hmm. from Google Play Store or iTunes, when it says, this application needs access to your contacts, to your camera and microphone, you know, my guess, and, and you know, 
most people will not say, oh, well, I'm, I'm just not going to use this anything. I, I don't. I make sure I don't install that app. If okay, I'm done in like a minute and a half now. I, I Can I leave one yeah. remedy? Yeah. And so if you are a victim of a scam that uh, was, you know, told you to transfer a certain amount of money through a wire transfer, and if you believe that you have been scammed and you have done that, your first uh, thing i like for you to do is call the FBI or the Secret Service. Uh, these two agencies can help. If it's a, within 72 hours, there's a very high likelihood that we might be able to get that reversed. Beyond 72 hours, we may be out of luck. But so just keep that in mind. If you believe that you've been scamming, you sent money through a wire transfer, uh, call the FBI, call your bank, but call early. Anybody else want to throw out something that they, we haven't maybe covered that you want people to hear? So actually with your apps on your phones, I actually will make sure that I um, turn off the app. So after it's done, I don't leave it running in the background. I just make sure I, I turn them well, off. So you can take care of it just by turning off all the apps. Right. And there are multi but there are multiple, multiple points. points yes. You have to go through multiple yes. areas. So that one is a whole nother show yes. on that. <laughs> but the, the thing I want to say is make sure that if someone calls you and tells you to send either money immediately or a gift card that you need to buy to pay back taxes or because you won the sweepstakes, hang up the phone. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, don't buy a gift card and give someone the pin over the phone. They're stealing your money. Sweepstakes. IRS. Uh, people, IRS, IRS people. Uh, You're not going to jail. In, in, not going people to are jail. in jail. Right. They're, they're, they're not jail. opening a case up like Okay, great, guys. Thank you so much. You guys have done a great job. I think we've been a lot of help to people. And mahalo to all of you viewers for joining us tonight. We thank our guests, Greg Dunn from the Better Business Bureau, Stanley Lau from Hawaii Tech Support, Jody Ito from the University of Hawaii, and Tuan Nguyen from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Next week, Insights asks, what happens when you outlive your savings? For people over 65, Hawaii has the longest life expectancy in the country. Women here living about six years longer than men. What happens to you or your parents when financial resources don't last a lifetime? Next week, we'll be part one of two shows focused on this subject. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Until next time, ahui ho.